So let's go ahead and get started. So good afternoon. I'm Pete Ron, Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation. I want to thank you all for being here today. I'd like to thank the council uh, for inviting us to provide an uh, overview of our draft six-year consolidated transportation plan for years 2020 uh, through 2025. Uh, Dan Janicek is right here in the front. He has copies of the CTP. If anybody wants one and does not have it, raise your hand. Dan will bring that to you. So Pat right up here. Anyone else? Oh, see a couple over here as well. All right, I'd like to introduce the MDOT team that's uh, here today. I can tell you we have superstars. Uh, at the department that uh, are, are just doing amazing jobs. So let's start with our MDOT MVA Administrator, Chrissy Neiser, down here on the end. MDOT MTA Administrator, Kevin Quinn. Uh, MDOT SHA Administrator, Greg Slater. Uh, MDOT uh, MAA uh, Executive Director, Ricky Smith. Our MDOT Maryland Transportation Authority Executive Director, Jim Ports. And from MDOT Maryland Port Administration, we have Kristen Fiddler, uh, Director of Harbor Development. And from the Secretary's Office, Dan, who was just introduced as our Regional Planner. Our <coughs> and our Director of Government Affairs, Jeff. Did I see Jeff here, Tosi? I did not, but we have Pilar back here. Raise your hands, so everybody knows. Um, that's Pilar Helm. And uh, Jacqueline Thorne is our project manager of priority projects for the Office of Freight and Multimodalism. Jacqueline, where, where? Okay. So, what I would like to do uh, is to let you know that these folks, and I see the county executive is here. How are you? Good. Thanks for being here. So the, the folks that uh, I've just introduced, I have to tell you, are an award-winning team, and it's across every phase of transportation industry. These awards uh, have come from uh, over 300 of the awards over the last uh, four and a half years, and more than 50 awards have come just this year. They range from design and engineering awards to accolades for safety, security, and excellence in customer service. I'm proud of our team, and I'm proud of what these awards mean. We're working to meet transportation needs of Marylanders and connect them to life's opportunities. So every year, we visit jurisdictions across Maryland for these very briefings. Anne Arundel is close to our hearts, and not just because you're home to our MDOT MVA headquarters or BWI Marshall Airport uh, and my office, or actually my home. Um, the county is also home to our beautiful state capital and to many of our hardworking employees. This afternoon, we'll talk about projects and initiatives that affect Anne Arundel. Of course, these include the Bay Bridge that there's plenty of interest in right now, and uh, the critical $27 million deck rehabilitation that is underway. I want you to know that we appreciate the role the Bay Bridge plays in the lives of residents of Anne Arundel and Queen Anne's counties, the city of Annapolis, and really all of Maryland. Our colleagues, friends, and neighbors are among the tens of thousands who cross the bridge as part of their everyday lives. I'm sure you know we've had no shortage of feedback, suggestions, and ideas regarding ways to lessen the impact of this project. I have received text from people that I would love to post, but if I had to blank out all of the uh, expletives, then it would make no sense whatsoever. Uh, so there has been no shortage of feedback that we have received. Today, we will share with you an update on where we are and where we're heading, including our work to accelerate cashless tolling and other step, uh, steps to expedite the project. We also know you're deeply interested in the Bay Crossing study. Uh, 
I'd like to thank Anne Arundel County for hosting two of the public workshops on the study. The study team has identified preliminary corridor alternatives retained for analysis as part of the Tier 1 NEPA study. Three corridors, as well as a no-build alternative, will face additional study as part of the Tier 1 NEPA process. We can answer questions you may have, and of course, we have uh, information online at baycrossingstudy.com. The public can sign up to receive updates on the website regarding our study. We had a great meeting with Anne Arundel officials, uh, officials uh, in the summer at the MACO conference in uh, Ocean City. And I want you to know how much I appreciated you taking the time to do that. You expressed interest in safety issues in the Maryland 2 intersection at Severna Park Marketplace. I can report that MDOT SHA is working on that. Crews are installing traffic channeling devices and signs to reduce the possibility of left turn crashes. And as far as our overall mission, I can tell you that MDOT's mission is focused very much on creating a safe, reliable, balanced transportation network that can help residences and businesses thrive. Thanks to the support of Governor Hogan, that's exactly what we're doing. For the CTP covering fiscal years 2020 to 2025, the Hogan administration will invest $15.3 billion in Maryland's transportation network. In addition, the Maryland Transportation Authority is investing $3.1 billion in our toll roads and bridges. This CTP is $1.1 billion less than last year's fiscal or final six-year CTP. The reduction is due to declining revenue projections, increasing operating transit costs for MTA and WMATA, and delivering a record construction program in record time, resulting in completed projects being removed from the CTP. The good news for you is that Governor Hogan signed bipartisan legislation last year that increases the funding formula for highway user revenues going to local jurisdictions from 9.6% to 13.5% through fiscal 2024. After years of fighting to increase the formula and adding annual grants instead, the Hogan administration is now providing a predictable revenue stream you can rely on to fund your local transportation projects. This year, Anne Arundel County, along with Annapolis and the community of Highland Beach, will receive a combined $8.13 million in highway user revenues. That's an increase of nearly $585,000 over last year. MDOT's overall revenues are not increasing as much as we had previously, previously estimated. MTA revenues and gas revenues are down due to fewer people using transit and gas stations selling fewer gallons at lower than projected gas prices. It's worth noting that while the amount of gallons of gas sold has gone down, the annual vehicle miles traveled has gone up. As more people choose cleaner, more efficient cars, this is a trend we expect to continue. Since fiscal 2015, annual vehicle miles traveled increased by nearly 3.5 billion miles, up to 60.8 billion miles traveled within our state. Another factor reducing our available capital funding is the rising operating costs for MTA and WMATA. While 8.5% of commuters use transit, 42% of our six-year budget goes to transit, and that number is rising each year. The state will provide WMATA with $805 million in operating and capital funds in 2020. This six-year CTP includes $4.9 billion in WMATA funding. In fiscal year 2022, Maryland's annual investment in WMATA will be larger than its investment in the State Highway Administration. Still, MDOT is making the most of every dollar and is delivering once-in-a-generation projects at an accelerated timeline. 
In 2015, the Hogan administration outlined a program of historic infrastructure investment. Over the past four years, MDOT has completed 1,069 projects nearly uh, worth nearly $5.9 billion. We're continuing this investment. We have 718 projects totaling $7.2 billion currently underway. These investments will improve our transportation network. While major projects garner most of the attention, preservation is equally important. MDOT SHA has reached a milestone treating more than half <coughs> of all lane miles on SHA's roads. That's 10,943 miles. The Hogan administration has been able to save Marylanders money and still invest in infrastructure, including the $189 million reconstruction of the I-895 bridge and widening the Baltimore Beltway. In the National Capital Region, the governor's plan to relieve congestion on the Capital Beltway and I-270 is a NEPA federal environment, I'm sorry, is in a NEPA federal environmental review process. Governor Hogan also has made record investments in transit. The launch of Baltimore Link in June of 2017 has led to more reliable access to jobs, education, and services for many Anne Arundel County residents. In March 2019, on-time performance of bus routes achieved a high of 71.4% compared with last year's 68.9% and the pre-Baltimore link rate of 59%. More people are using Baltimore link. While transit use across the nation has seen a decline of 2.3% over the past year, Baltimore link has seen a 1% increase. MDOT's toll modernization plan is another initiative affecting all Marylanders. In July, the governor announced that this plan will save Marylanders more than $28 million over five years. This would be the third round of toll relief during the Hogan administration, resulting in up to $344 million in savings. I'm sure you've heard that the Key Bridge in Baltimore and the Hatem Bridge on the Harford and Cecil County lines are now cashless with motorists paying tolls via Easy Pass or video tolling. Cashless tolling results in less congestion, better fuel efficiency, and reduced vehicle emissions. It also improves driver safety and gives us a safer work environment for our employees. Hatem and Key were good candidates for cashless tolling because so many customers on those two bridges already use EasyPass. 93% on the Hatem Bridge and 80% on the Key Bridge. We've been operating the Bay Bridge under a cashless system during certain periods to help improve traffic flows during peak times during the DEC project. Governor Hogan has directed us to expedite full-time cashless tolling at the Bay Bridge. Part of our strategy will be to boost EasyPass registration so that people aren't getting so many bills in the mail from video tolling. Currently, about 74% of Bay Bridge drivers use EasyPass. We'd like to get that number up, so anything you could do to encourage your constituents to get a free transponder and enroll in EasyPass would be greatly appreciated. Elsewhere around the state, we've heard good news on a project that affects all Maryland. Approval of the $125 million in federal funds for the Howard Street Tunnel in Baltimore. This project will allow us to double stack containers from the Port of Baltimore. This will ease truck traffic, boost our economy, and create jobs. The Port of Baltimore is the number one port in America for automobiles and roll-on, roll-off machinery. We are coming off our best year ever for general cargo at the state-owned marine terminals, 11 million tons in fiscal 2019. Another place we're setting records is BWI Marshall uh, Airport, an economic engine for all of Maryland. BWI continues to be recognized by industry and consumer groups for excellent service and passenger amenities. A year ago, Condé Nast Traveler Magazine ranked BWI the 10th best U.S. airport. 
In 2018, 27.1 million passengers came through BWI, a new record. BWI is the busiest airport in the region and produces an annual economic impact of $9.3 billion while supporting 106,000 jobs. And if you're planning to travel to BWI, I encourage you to check your status with Real ID, the federal law passed in 2005 after the tragic 9-11 terrorist attack. The deadline is October 1st of next year. Our MDOT Motor Vehicle Administration is doing a fantastic job of getting Marylanders ready. In fact, Maryland was the first state in the nation to be recertified by the Department of Homeland Security for Real ID compliance. Administrator Neiser will talk about our Real ID in just a bit. I'm proud to say that customer satisfaction ratings at MDOT MVA for stash, <coughs> staff professionalism, friendliness, and helpfulness remain above 98%. We are expanding on that with Customer Connect, a system that will change the way MDOT MVA does business. Customer Connect will allow us to deliver more services online and complete transactions more efficiently and accurately. We will launch in May of 2020 with certain vehicle services and business licensing. And MDOT is committed to a multimodal approach to transportation, and that includes, com includes commuter choice, which promotes alternatives to driving alone to work, which is public transportation, ride sharing, biking, walking, teleworking, and flexible work schedules. Through the Maryland Commuter Tax Credit, businesses can qualify for a tax credit of up to $100 per employee, and the Guaranteed Ride Home Program can make sure commuters have free emergency rides when needed. Evidence shows that employers who offer commuter benefits and flexibility attract and retain top talent. So I urge you to go to commuterchoicemaryland.com for more information. And another initiative I'm proud of is Opportunity MDOT, our program to enlist small, minority, and disadvantaged businesses to be part of the network bidding for work on the I-495 and I-270 P3, as well as other MDOT projects. Recruitment, workforce development, and training are components of Opportunity MDOT. I'm truly excited about this. While we're improving Maryland's transportation network, we can also create life-changing opportunities for local firms and local workers. And before I turn it over to our administrators, I want to thank you again for hosting us today. I appreciate the guidance that Anne Arundel County has provided, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Now, I will ask representatives of MDOT's business units to update you on projects in your county, starting with MDOT SHA and Administrator Greg Slater. Thank you, Pete. I'd like to provide an update on MDOT SHA our roads and bridges, including projects that have direct impact right here in Anne Arundel County. Before going through that, I'd like to note something that concerns all of us at MDOT, the fact that there were more than 500 fatalities on Maryland roadways last year. Of those, 25% were pedestrians. We're working to tackle that issue. Understanding that there's no one-size-fits-all formula, we are introducing new tools for our engineers. MDOT SHA is releasing a draft of our context-driven access and mobility for all users guidance document. Uh, this is a land use based guide that enables flexibility and design solutions to address major issues of safety and accessibility for pedestrians and non-motorized users, while still considering the transportation needs of the motoring public. Along with best practices, practices and design tools, this context guide provides a process to balance Maryland's transportation system with access, mobility, and safety needs of the individual communities that our roadways drive through. I brought several copies uh, if you'd like to take one with you. With your move over Anne Arundel Transportation Master Plan, we see a similar focus on safe, practical, and well-functioning transportation networks. 
Like you, we see coordination and communication as a key strategy in keeping county residents, businesses, and travelers informed about joint progress. Since our meeting last year, M.SHA has completed several projects as part of our system preservation program, including resurfacing on Maryland 295, the Baldwin Washington Parkway between Maryland 100 and 175. We've resurfaced uh, Maryland 176 Dorsey Road between 170 Telegraph Road and Maryland 648, which is Baltimore Annapolis Boulevard, right there in Hanover. We resurfaced Maryland 103, that's Parkway Drive South between Race Road and the Howard County Line. So 22, we, the uh, $22.8 million U.S. 57 River Ridge Rehabilitation Project, which added the fourth lane eastbound, continues to be recognized as a major innovative success. Uh, in July, Engineering News Record Mid-Atlantic awarded the project its 2019 Best Highway Bridge Project. We will continue to use these innovative and pragmatic solutions to deliver exceptional projects to benefit millions of motorists in Maryland. A one mile widening between Disney and Reese Road, uh, add travel lanes on Maryland 175, also add bike and pedestrian amenities, including a trail along 175. The final paving is ongoing and the project will be complete next spring. In other areas, the construction project for Maryland 175 295 is now scheduled to re-advertise in the fall of 2020. Deferring the start time allows M.SHA to work with our partners to address substantial utility issues along that corridor that need to be relocated. This is a $73 million project to reconstruct the interchange at 175 and 295, including roadway widening up to six lanes. The Maryland 424 sidewalk construction between Duke of Kent Drive and 450 is currently underway. As we work to address recurring flooding along Maryland 450 Defense Highway, the culvert replacement project near Bacon Ridge Branch is expected to be completed later this fall. Construction is also underway for a $1.8 million Maryland 174 intersection project in Severn to improve traffic operations and safety. The scheduled completion is late summer of 2020. The Maryland 171 Church Street Safety and Resurfacing Project from Maryland 2 to the Baltimore City Line will be complete this fall. This project also includes upgrades to sidewalks and all of the ADA sidewalk ramps. M.SHA is moving forward with the installation of a new high-intensity active activated crosswalk beacon, a hawk signal at Maryland 450 Annapolis uh, West Street in anticipation of the reconstructed Annapolis Library opening early next year. We consolidated three unsignalized crosswalks and included a median refuge, refuge to enhance pedestrian safety in that corridor. We're also using cutting edge smart signal technology to monitor real time traffic conditions. We have software that adjusts the timing of traffic signals and synchronizes the entire corridor and deploys artificial intelligence to keep traffic moving and adaptable. M.SHA completed installations of smart signals on Maryland 2 from Harbor Center Drive to Tarragon Lane and Maryland 3 from 450 to St. Stephen's Church Road. The additional locations are also being installed now. Maryland 2 from the MVA entrance to Maryland 270, Maryland 2 from Arnold Road to Jumpers Hole Road, and Maryland 450 from 178 to Maryland 2. These should all be operational by the end of the year. M.SHA is working with our local partners here in Anne Arundel County to deliver bike and pedestrian projects using our transportation alternatives, our rec trails program, and our bikeways grant programs. Currently, we're partnering four projects worth $8.7 million and one other project about $80,000 in state grants. These include the WBNA Trail Bridge over the Patuxent River, Phase 1 of the South Shore Trail, and Phase 2 of the Broadneck Peninsula Trail. I'm also very happy to announce several grants for 2020, 2.6 million dollars for construction of the phase three of the Broadneck Peninsula Trail, 800,000 for construction of the Broadneck Peninsula Trail phase 1B, and $80,000 for the design of the Poplar Trail extension to the South Shore Trail, so integrating that trail network. And now let me turn it over to Administrator Neiser from the MVA. Thank you, Greg. 
It's great to be here in Anne Arundel County. And as the Secretary mentioned at M.MBA, we're squarely focused on making sure all Marylanders are aware of the federal real ID requirement. That was legislation passed after the tragic events of 9-11 that requires identity, proof of identity, social security, and two proofs of Maryland residency be on file with M.MBA. The federal deadline is October 1, 2020. And after that date, uh, no American will be able to board an airplane or enter a federal facility using their driver's license or ID card unless it is real ID compliant. There are alternative identification that you can use, such as a U.S. passport. So we're working hard to make sure that all Marylanders are aware of the requirement and trying to do it in a way that's customer friendly. When you visit one of our 24 statewide branch offices, we've encouraged customers to make an appointment. With an appointment, we guarantee to see you within 15 minutes. Um, since January alone, we've had 418,000 customers seen with appointments, so it's been very well received um, to get that customer in and out quickly. To date, 2.45 million Marylanders are real ID ready, meaning they've submitted the required documents and they have the driver's license or ID card with a star on it. Here in Anne Arundel County, 53% of your residents are now real ID compliant, so it's good progress, but we want to continue to make sure the word is out there. Um, one thing we've done to expand on the convenience factor is to extend Saturday hours until 4.30 at a select number of M.MBA branch offices. That includes the Glen Burnie branch office here in Anne Arundel County. Um, we're also open at all of our branches on Thursday night until 6.30. So those are some convenient times that I encourage you to make sure your constituents are aware of in order to get an appointment or stop in and see us. We're also trying to get out in the community and provide information on Real ID. So in Anne Arundel County, we were out at Severna Park for the National Night Out in Pasadena, O'Malley, and Pinewood Village Senior Centers. We also have, uh, with our partnership with MAA, Real ID ambassadors at BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport twice a month to help travelers and make sure that they're aware of the Real ID compliance uh, requirements. If you would like for us to come out to another association or event that's in the area, please just reach out to me directly and we'll be happy to make that happen. I think it is a one of those issues that it is easier to answer questions in person sometimes than refer somebody to the website or other information. I would encourage you to have all customers and constituents look at our Real ID lookup tool that will tell them whether or not they're compliant. You can go to the main page of our website at mva.maryland.gov slash Real ID. All you need is your driver's license or ID card number and that'll tell you if you're compliant or not. If you're not compliant, it'll walk you through the process of what you need to do in terms of gathering your documents and making an appointment. In addition to customer service, we're also squarely focused on highway safety. As Greg mentioned, that 513 number of fatalities is not just a number. Those are families that are impacted, friends that are, are not there anymore. And so we are dedicated to driving that number down to zero. Here in Anne Arundel County, there were 52 fatalities in 2018, which actually was an increase from the prior year when there were 41. We know that regardless of what the number is, the only acceptable number for us is zero. And so we want to work with you to continue to um, make those numbers decrease. In September, Governor Hogan announced more than 127,000 in highway safety grant funding, including money for Anne Arundel County Police Department and Annapolis Police Department. That'll contribute to overtime efforts to help save lives. I'm pleased to continue our work with the county developing and implementing a highway safety plan. Uh, we truly believe that the only way to reach that goal of zero fatalities is work together at the federal, state, and local level and develop a plan that works here in the local community. We're also looking at how we can use technology to drive down the numbers. So in August at the MACO conference, we deployed our new driver alcohol detection system for safety. It's a system where sensors in the vehicle can detect alcohol on the breath, and if the driver has a breath alcohol content above 0.08, it won't allow the vehicle to, to start. And it can be set at zero if it's a young driver. Um, it's a great new technology that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates could save 68% of impaired driving fatalities. And so we're proud to be the first state in the country to test this technology on our fleet vehicles. And the goal is to determine that they hold up with that wear and tear, driving in different conditions 
applications with the goal for manufacturers to be able to deploy that in privately sold vehicles, hopefully in the next several years, and then customers will have the option to purchase that as a feature, just like you would purchase other features on your vehicle. As Secretary Ron mentioned, next May, we're going to roll out a big IT modernization project called Customer Connect. It will allow businesses and individuals to complete more transactions than ever before through our online system. As one issue for businesses, they really haven't been able to do a lot of transactions online, and the system is going to open up um, the availability of those services. And so we are going to be communicating with our customers as we approach that May 26, um, 2020 implementation date to make sure they're aware of that and make that transition as soon as possible. We're continually looking for ways that we can provide better customer service, and um, I was really excited to be um, at the Glen Burnie branch location announcing our first partnership with the Department of Veterans Affairs, and Senator Bida was there with us. It was a great day. Um, Veterans Affairs actually didn't have a location in Anne Arundel County, so we were able to deploy that, allow our veterans to be able to answer or get questions answered and, and services provided. Um, Anne Arundel County has the second largest population population of veterans, as you probably know, so it's a great benefit for individuals residing in Anne Arundel County. It's just one of the ways that we are trying to honor our veterans and also make it easier for all customers to do business in a one-stop shop kind of approach. What I'm most proud of is what Pete mentioned in terms of that 98% customer satisfaction with the increased volume we've seen in Real ID. Our agents continue to do a tremendous job delivering customer service and making sure that you know they're making that experience as pleasurable as possible. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to update you today and happy to answer any questions at the end. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Administrator Kevin. All right, thanks, Chrissy. And uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, I'm Kevin Quinn, administrator of MDOT MTA, and really excited to talk to you today about the exciting, significant investments we're making in Anne Arundel County, including the operation of 10 commuter bus routes to Washington and Baltimore, Mark Train Service operating to Baltimore and Washington, uh, our light rail service, five Baltimore Link uh, bus routes. Uh, this year, we're providing $3.8 million in operating and capital grants to support the transit systems in the county and the city of Annapolis. The this includes three medium-duty bus uh, transit replacements, uh, buses for the county, and two medium-duty replacement buses, office furniture, and ongoing preventative maintenance for Annapolis. In addition, uh, we also provide more than $900,000 to support two nonprofits that transport seniors and people with disabilities, including $210,000 to Partners in Care. As Secretary Ron noted, MDOT MTA has improved on-time performance of our core bus system from around 59% in fall of 2016 to 71.4% in March 2019. Uh, on-time performance of our bus system continues to be a prime focus of ours. Uh, we also continue to make investments in technology that enhance our riders' experience. Uh, CharmPass, our mobile transit app uh, that can be used to purchase fares for bus, light rail, metro, mark, and commuter bus, uh, also offers a free 90-minute transfer when used on bus, light rail, and metro. And this free transfer provides a savings of nearly $150 annually for those customers that used to purchase a day pass. To date, we've had more than 1 million Charm Pass purchases. In addition, we continue our partnership with the Transit app to provide real-time bus arrival information to our riders. Real-time information for commuter bus routes was added to the Transit app in June. And since launch, 200,000 users have downloaded that app. MDOT MTA continues to invest in new vehicles as well, purchasing 70 new buses each year under our five-year, $211 million contract to ensure fleet continuity through 2024. And additionally, our light rail vehicles are undergoing a $160 million comprehensive overhaul. Safety is the top priority for us at M.MTA, uh, as well as throughout the, uh, the agency, and we appreciate our mutual aid partnership with Anne Arundel County Police. Uh, M.MTA Police will continue to monitor our light rail link stops to maintain a safe system for both our riders and the community. We also support the county's number one transit priority and are working with you on the Odenton Mark Station transit-oriented development. We know that Anne Arundel residents also rely on Mark commuter rail service to get to jobs in Washington, D.C and other destinations. The MDOT MTA investment of $54 million to overhaul 63 Mark III passenger coaches is well underway. The entire fleet will be overhauled by 2021, and this project includes upgraded seats, communications, air brakes, HVAC, and doors. 
M.MT continues to make improvements to the MARC system and has invested $61 million recently to deploy eight new MARC locomotives. Improvements to the BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport Mark Station passenger area are nearly complete, and the $7.2 million project includes upgrades to passenger amenities in the waiting area, as well as the ticket office. MDOT MTA is also leading the development of the Regional Transit Plan for Central Maryland, a very exciting project. And this plan involves public outreach and work with stakeholders and jurisdictions, including Anne Arundel, to develop a shared vision for transit in the region over the next 25 years. And to date, MDOT MTA has held over 30 public outreach events, including four in Anne Arundel County. We're visiting all areas of the county and have spoken with people at Cromwell Station, the Glen Burnie Regional Library, Henry Hine Building, and the Fiesta Latina. We'll continue outreach through next summer and look forward to sharing and discussing ideas with our stakeholders. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ricky at the Maryland Aviation Administration. Ricky. Good afternoon. So the Maryland Department of Transportation, Maryland Aviation Administration offers excellent customer service to our traveling public and customers that use the airport, both for BWI Marshall and Martin State Airports. BWI Marshall remains a major international gateway for Maryland and the entire national capital region. With the new seven-year use and lease agreement in place, we are working with our airline partners to ensure the airport remains positioned to serve travelers with excellent service and modern facilities. This new agreement with 15 signatory airlines, these are full service airlines, will result in over $1.2 billion in revenues to the airport and nearly $800 million in capital projects for which the airlines will pay. We're moving rapidly on an aggressive improvement program that will continue to add services and amenities for our customers while growing the business and adding air service opportunities for the airlines. A year ago, we completed a six-gate addition to our international concourse. Construction is now underway on a 55,000-square-foot five-gate extension to Concourse A, which serves Southwest Airlines. This project, which is expected to be complete in summer of 2020, includes new food and retail concessions and updated restrooms. The work is an important first step. It's an enabling project for a multi-year upgrade to the Terminal AB, which is the center of operations for Southwest Airlines at BWI Marshall Airport. This concourse AB connector and baggage handling system improvements program will transform this portion of the airport and create a better experience for passengers. The improvements will include direct concourse to concourse connectivity, improved concessions, expanded hold rooms, and modern restrooms all sitting atop a new state-of-the-art baggage handling system. BWI Marshall is also working to support construction of a major aircraft maintenance facility for the airport's largest airline partner, Southwest Airlines. This will be the airline's first maintenance facility in the Northeast. The airport is supporting the overall construction of the maintenance base with about $50 million in infrastructure improvements such as utility work, site preparation, and taxiway access. Air cargo operations also continue to grow at BWI Marshall. Cargo operations have grown 80% over the past five years and continued growth is expected in the coming years. Widely recognized as the easy come, easy go airport for the mid-Atlantic region, BWI Marshall remains committed to excellent customer service, easy access, and affordable fares. BWI Marshall is the big brother in the M.MA family, but we should also note that Martin State Airport, a state-owned and important general aviation and FAA-designated reliever airport, supports 2,400 jobs and generates nearly $580 million in economic activity. We also have responsibility for regional aviation assistance, um, which includes support for 35 public-use airports throughout the state. M.AMA regulates these regional airports and administers the statewide, the statewide aviation grant program that provides funding for improvements, for improvement projects, including safety and other important uh, matters related to those airports. For fiscal year 2020, M.AMA will provide over $2.48 million in state support for Maryland's public use airports. That being said, I will now turn it over to the Maryland Transportation Authority. Thank you. you. You got your 
Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mary O'Keefe. I'm chief of staff for MDTA. Uh, Jim just had to step out for an emergency call. Um, I'll be reading his remarks. As Secretary Ron noted, and I'm sure you're aware, the $27 million deck rehabilitation project on the westbound Bay Bridge is underway. The project involves replacing the deck surface of the westbound span right lane, sealing the, the bridge deck, and replacing the lane signal gantries and steel rail posts. The deck surface of the right lane has reached the end of its service life and is severely deteriorated. This presents a number of safety risks given the frequency of the patching and emergency holding um, and the emergency holding patches. We understand the county's concerns about the impact of this project on your citizens. And last month, Gary, uh, Governor Hogan directed us to look at every possible solution to expedite the project. Going forward, work will be done on both day and night shifts, seven days a week, using multiple crews. Two-way traffic operations will be res reserved for emergency situations and severe backups only. Cashless tolling on Thursdays and Fridays will continue to start at noon and will end at 8 p.m. As part of this commitment to expedite this project, the contractor will now work through Thanksgiving week this year. Additionally, we are developing an aggressive timeline to implement full-time all-electronic tolling as soon as possible. We are confident these actions will allow us to make these repairs as quickly as we can and limit the impact on local residents. We also want to thank the Maryland Department of Commerce and local businesses on both sides of the bridge for helping us spread the word, encouraging travelers, go early and stay late over the holiday season. As we move toward cashless tolling at the Bay Bridge, there's never been a better time to get an easy pass. It saves time, it's good for the environment, and signing up is easy. From fiscal year 2018 to 2019, the number of easy pass accounts in Anne Arundel County has increased by more than 12%. And as Secretary Ron noted, we'd love to get that even higher. By the way, in FY 2019, transactions at the Bay Bridge increased 1.6% to more than 13.66 million total transactions. Meanwhile, the Maryland Transportation Authority is excited to begin delivering our third generation tolling system. We call it 3G, which will revolutionize the way we serve our customers. The system will upgrade toll collection hardware and software with the latest technology and modernize MDTA customer service. The MDTA board sought public opinion and held hearings on a toll modernization proposal that includes lowering toll rates, a new payment option, and a new discount for customers starting in 2020. Toll rates would be reduced 50% for motorcycles and would be cut 25 and 17% respectively for light vehicles towing one and two axle trailers, such as those used for watercraft or landscaping equipment. A new way to pay, called pay by plate, will benefit infrequent toll customers as well as those who don't have a prepaid EasyPass balance. And the plan also includes a new 15% discount for video tolling customers who pay before their invoices are mailed. A final report was submitted on October 31st and will be posted online for public comment. And the MDTA board is scheduled to vote on a recommendation at its November 21st meeting. Work continues on the $189 million I-895 bridge project, which involves work in the harbor tunnel and on the elevated roadway north of the tunnel. A 60-day closure of the northbound tube was completed two days early, and the southbound tube closure will occur next spring. The project is scheduled to be completed in July 2021. At MDTA, we strive to be good stewards of the environment. Our contractor for the I-895 Patapsco flat superstructure replacement worked with DNR to use pieces of the demolished roadway to build oyster reefs in the Chesapeake Bay. Now I'll turn it over to Kristen from the Maryland Port Administration. 
Great, thank you, Kat. Mary. Um, good afternoon, Kristen Fidler with the Maryland Department of Transportation, Maryland Port Administration. As Secretary Ron mentioned, the Port of Baltimore continues to perform at a high level. Last year, the port handled a record 850,147 cars and light trucks, the eighth consecutive year it finished first among all US ports for automobiles. We also finished number one again for roll-on, roll-off machinery. The port ranks ninth among all US ports for dollar value of cargo with $59.7 billion last year and 11th for total foreign cargo tonnage with 43 million tons. We are also one of the top economic engines in the state of Maryland. Under Governor Hogan, direct jobs at the port have increased by about 1,680 and the number of jobs in Maryland connected in some way to the port has increased by almost 12,000. The Port of Baltimore is one of the only ports on the East Coast to have the infrastructure needed for today's largest container vessels. Uh, we welcomed our biggest ship ever, the Evergreen Triton, this past May. That vessel held 14,424 20-foot long containers and was as long as four football fields. It was massive. We're currently working with Ports America Chesapeake to construct a second 50-foot deep berth, and that will be operational in 2021. This second 50-foot deep berth will allow us to handle two huge container vessels at the same time. Aside from our cargo and cruise responsibilities, the port continues to work to be a good environmental steward. With our award-winning dredging program, we have rebuilt eroded islands in the Chesapeake Bay using sediment from the channels leading to the Port of Baltimore. And just last month, we announced an agreement with the US Army Corps of Engineers to again use dredge material from the shipping lanes in the bay to help rebuild two eroded islands near Dorchester County. And one last green initiative, the port's dray truck replacement program on our terminals has resulted in 172 older dray trucks being replaced with newer, cleaner running engines. And that wraps it up for me, and I'm happy to turn it back over to Secretary Ron. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you all for having us here today. And I'd like to close by noting that all these great things that MDOT is doing all of us hold one thing in common, and that is that safety remains our number one priority. And I think that's evident by a number of things we do, but let, just wait to hear this. We brought a lot of people together. They put a lot of thought into it to how we could communicate our commitment to safety. And so we have a hashtag called hashtag M.Safety. <laughs> Just amazing to me. <laughs> MD dot it's safety or is it MDOT? MDOT safety with the hashtag in front. <laughs> so, <laughs> so through all of our campaigns that stress work zone safety, speed enforcement, and ways to end impaired and distracted driving, I'd like to commend. MDOT MVA's Highway Safety Office, and along with partners like you, the Highway Safety Office is making strides in educating drivers on the importance of safe behaviors on our driveway, or on our roadways. So peer activism can influence driving habits for the better. And here in Anne Arundel County, I'd like to thank Southern High School for enrolling in our Making It Click campaign, which promotes seat belt use for all drivers and passengers. One of the results of that effort, as we can have our model show you, is our seat belt tie. And we also, for the ladies, have seat belt scarves. And, um, and at our Highway Safety Summit in April, we announced an 8.5% decrease in roadway fas uh, fatalities in Maryland compared to the previous year. Now that's encouraging, but our work is far from done. Earlier in this briefing, we discussed trails and pedestrian safety. And last spring, MDOT SHA introduced a pedestrian safety program that began with installation of traffic calming measures and speed limit reductions in some business districts in Prince George's and Montgomery County. We'll be doing more of that in the coming years. 
I would like to invite you to join Governor Hogan at the 16th annual Maryland Remembers Ceremony here in Annapolis. The event recognizes victims of impaired driving crashes and their surviving family members. Um, it'll be on November the 26th at 11 a.m. at the Miller Office Building, and it's a very moving and important ceremony. Finally, I would like to urge everyone to sign our driver safety pledge. Now, some of you might have done this from last year when I was urging the same thing, but it is a pledge to follow relatively simple, common sense driving behavior for 30 days. So all it is is a commitment that for 30 days, the person who signs this is going to observe these traffic laws. And what we have found is that number one, if you do something for 21 days, it becomes a habit, but also it is a way to put peer pressure on people that you work with to also sign the pledge. And it's a great tool if you have young drivers at home and you want to emphasize on them the proper driving behaviors. And so we have copies of this somewhere. Does anyone want to tell me where we have these? right here, uh, and I would urge you to take one, sign it, commit to 30 days to observe these driving habits, and to also use that with family members. Maybe you have a spouse that needs a little uh, encouragement. Great way to start that conversation. So um, we have uh, pretty much relied, our reduced, um, produced, uh, all of the information that we had intended here. Uh, if you are interested in following our CTP tour, you can follow us on hashtag CPT or CTP tour. Again, another high level team worked on coming up with the hashtag. And uh, you can see how we're, how we're doing as we present around the state. And now we'd be happy to have a presentation from the county executive and answer questions uh, that, that you may have as well as a presentation. Yes, sir. This is your, you know, this is your facility. It is. They, they usually tell me that I, is there a speaker here that I often want to come down here as the public and speak to the council, but they tell me that um, I shouldn't do that, that uh, I should let the council do their job. So it's great to be down here speaking to you all. Um, and um, I want to thank you for com coming out here and, and doing this. I've heard about the road show. It's kind of like a rock concert. You all are very entertaining, actually much more entertaining than I expected. Um, and, and you, Secretary Ron, are... are <clears throat> I have to admit, when you're getting ready to meet with the transportation folks, you're very angry coming in. And Secretary Ron is, is just like you are when you sit in traffic. And Secretary Ron has this smile and this way about him that <clears throat> you just walk out <clears throat> kind of feeling like um, the world is, is fine and I'll just sit in traffic for a while and it'll be okay. Um, <laughs> So we did have a very good meeting uh, this summer at MAKO. Um, you know, we reviewed what's in our letter, and I'm not going to go through everything in our priority letter because you have it. You've had it for a long time. Hopefully people in the room have seen it. Um, I'm very pleased that we have a good turnout because one of the messages um, this summer to us was folks don't show up in Anne Arundel County for this meeting, and the county executive's not been presenting at the meeting lately, and you need to be there. So we are here, and thank you, everybody else, for being here um, because we have serious issues. Um, it's interesting that uh, we do a poll, the community college does a poll twice a year in Anne Arundel County. It's a public opinion poll and it's, it's pretty accurate. It's very well done. And the last few uh, polls, the, the number one issue on people's mind has been opioid addiction and the opioid crisis. And uh, this one that came out last week, can you guess what the number one issue was? Traffic. Yes. Number two issue was overdevelopment. So um, it's it's um, we spend a lot of time sitting in our cars, and we lose a lot of time, as you know, um, that would be better spent with our families and doing other things. Um, when we met during the summer. Uh, you know, I asked you. You talked about the the drop in revenue, um, the 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 
the success with fuel efficiency and how that was impacting your revenues. Um, I went back and looked, and it's for the county. It's unbelievable that that in 2007 we had 33 million dollars, and we're down to 3.2 million dollars. Um, it's it's a 90 percent drop. We are we are in a place where we're having to step up. I know it's difficult for you, um, but. I think that um, you know my, my suggestion was to go to the governor and say, let's look at the formula, and let's look at ways of raving, raising revenue. And you said, well, that's not really on the table. But I want you to go back to the governor and remind him that we have to come up with ways of changing the formula so that it works in these modern times and we don't have this reduction as a result of, of uh, fuel efficiency and hopefully electric cars in the future. We have to come up with a way to create revenue um, um, for transportation. Um, in our county, the, uh, the problem is largely about development. We've grown a lot. Uh, we've grown by about 1% a year in most of the years recently. And people are, are fed up with it. And um, we can either stop growing completely and say, countywide moratorium on all development, or we can figure out the areas of the county where we want to grow. And I think we're being smart about it, and I think our residents have picked up on transit-oriented development, and what a good idea that is, that we can do development in areas where there's transit, and it gets people out of their cars. You understand that. Um, you all did a beautiful, a beautiful preliminary plan for what the Cromwell Station could look like with transit-oriented development. And the one thing that you told me that you could do easily, because it doesn't cost any money, is to designate transit-oriented oriented development sites for us at Cromwell, um, at the Laurel Racetrack Mark Station there, at BWI Mark and Light Rail, and of course at Odenton is already a transit-oriented development. But for Odenton, I do want to say that we had $5 million set aside from the state to do a parking garage there. We have a lot of people using, using that train, that Mark Station, and they're parking on the sides of roads. Um, there's just not enough parking, and if we can get that money, that support back from you that you took away, it's going to help us because we are very aggressively working on a plan to build a, um, a parking garage there so that people can park close to the station. Um, the NEPA study. <laughs> Got to talk about the Bay Bridge. Got to talk about ferries, right? Pittman's thinking about ferries. I'm not just thinking about ferries, believe me. Um, I've not suggested and I won't suggest that we could take all the traffic off the bridge and put it onto boats. Um, but I do think and what was, what was disappointing to me, and I know this created some frustration um, from some people on your end. The, you know, the governor's spokesperson suggested that I didn't understand traffic on the Bay Bridge and, and you know, some, some, um, some political, political comments around that. But I really think that it's a serious issue that we're spending $5 million on a, on a study. And it's true, there's a lot we don't know, there's a lot I don't know, which is why we sent a letter on September 9th asking for the data behind the study. The slide presentation is great, but we really need to know, um, first of all, why these three sites, um, all, all of the rest of the, the 14 sites were discounted. Um, there's no question in our minds that putting a bridge that goes, um, that goes through the Mayo Peninsula over a nature park um, or, the Pas or Pasadena um, um, going through their park there um, are, are terrible for the local communities and terrible for the environment. And I was glad to hear that the governor doesn't support them either, but I understand you need to go through the NEPA study. Um, but when you, did, when, you, when you said that <clears throat> each of the alternative modes of transit on their own wouldn't solve the problem, Clearly, that's the case. But when you do the math and you look at the possibilities of the impacts of all electric tolling, the impacts of variable tolling, um, the impacts of potentially bus rapid transit and more carpooling, and even potentially rail, I understand the problems with that since people are going to lots of different locations on the other side, as well as adding in ferries that would come at different locations across the bay that could be very popular for families on vacations. And then you look at projections for growth on the other side. I understand that there are development interests that want to grow over there, but I don't think the residents in Queen Anne County are quite as enthusiastic about development happen happening over there, that maybe there won't be 16,000 additional cars a day, particularly if you pay for the toll by increasing rates 
to a much higher level, I suspect that would reduce the traffic on the toll. So looking at all those numbers would be very useful for all of us. And, and um, I, we did get a response finally on that letter, but it didn't address the question of whether we can get, whether we can get that data. So that's something that I'd love to, to, to get so that we can all look at the numbers together. We can see what our $5 million has gone for and see how we want to see how we want to move forward. I think there's a possibility that there is a no build option. Um, and I think we have to seriously look at that. Um, we're working with Queen Anne County. They, they met with you, I know, on the 21st. We share a lot of the same concerns on the redecking. We applaud the governor for speeding up the process. We applaud the governor for, for um, working faster to get the all-electric tolling. We think that's going to be helpful. Um, let me jump into to some of the development, some of the, uh, um, the items in our priority letter, particularly Route 2 and Route 3. Um, and these are areas, both of them, we have particularly in Route 3 this problem, and I think we've caused the problem as much as anybody, um, but the road has to, has to um, evolve with what we've done, is we've created commercial development and a lot of residential development on that Route 3 corridor. Cars are coming in and out all the time, and for years we've been saying, we need a study, we need a plan, it's your road. We're willing to contribute, we're willing to help. Um, we're, I'll, I'll talk about what we're doing on money for transportation in a moment, but we have to get that done. I know we got a letter from you saying that you're starting to do the counts and that you're, you know, you were hoping to have it done by this summer. Um, it's, it's, it's behind schedule, um, but we need to get that done. We need to get a plan for that. Um, and Ritchie Highway is a similar problem, and, and the, uh, we have failing intersections that um, are really at the point where we're considering the question of whether to do, for both of those corridors, development moratoria until stop all development until we can address the traffic problem. And, and I think that's a message that we want to send up the ladder and, and really look seriously at whether it's time to, to start work on Route 2 and Route 3 corridors. The traffic is not moving. Um, you've been very helpful with us on bike and pedestrian trails. Um, we're very proud of what's going on. Uh, the Broadneck Trail, South Shore Trail, we're getting started, BNA Trail. We need to get across Route 2 to connect the BNA and the, Bra the Broadneck. Um, and, um, and we're going to continue to push for those. Um, and we appreciate your support on those. Um, the, the LOTS funding, the locally operated transit funding, when we look at the numbers compared to other counties for our population and our density, um, our population is getting more dense and we're having to get serious about um, transit. And um, we have our, our transportation director, Ramon Robinson, is here and he has been working hard to put plans together. We have added some service. Um, uh, but we've lost some support. Uh, we had a parking lot in Crofton that you all were helping to f fund the rental for um, that you've pulled away from. The Fort Meade shuttle, we had two years of support from the state. You've pulled away from that. We've picked that up. But uh, we're looking at, at <clears throat> on-demand services in South County. Uh, we've, we've just started it. Um, we're looking at that for Glen Burnie and Brooklyn Park, areas where we have high poverty levels and people have zero transportation. And um, we're going to need some help with that because we're going to have to acquire vehicles. Um, so um, we're going to continue to ask you for an increase in our funding for transit in the county. Um, an issue that I should have started with. Um, Route 450, we talked about it over the summer, the flooding, the ice in the winter from the flooding. We, um, we read in the paper just a couple days ago, there was yet another article about this, and it's, uh, we, we were pleased to hear that you were spending a million dollars for some culverts, but then I was disappointed to hear that that was really because those culverts are, are, are um, compromised and the road could collapse. That's not actually where the flooding is. So where the flooding is, there seems to not be a plan other than some clearing every once in a while, and they just did some clearing and just less than two inches of rain, and once again, the road was closed. It's been closed about 60 times in the last year, and I'm guessing you're gonna hear more about that from other people who stand up. That, that just has to happen because we are losing that road. People, you know, the emergency vehicles can't get through. It just doesn't make sense to have a road that you can't, that, that is closed 60 or more times in a year. So we are pleading with you on Route 450 um, to get that cleared. Um, so I, I don't want to go on and on with this. I just, I want to say that um, it really comes down to funding, like everything else. 
And what we've done in our county is uh, everybody told us that you can't ask for money, you can't raise money, we're broke and nobody wants to pay taxes, um, despite the, the fact that, that the revenue has come so far down on uh, 90% um, in, in, in our uh, highway revenue. And so what we did was we had town halls and we asked people what they wanted and they told us what they wanted and we actually did raise revenue and we did a, a one-tenth of one percent income tax and um, it's going to create 250 million in capital improvements and at least 75 million of that is going to go to transportation projects and we're hoping that we can dangle that money in front of you as an incentive to invest your money and we can partner and get some of these projects going. Um, but it's not really a killer politically. That same poll that, that showed that, um, that people care about trans traffic more than anything else also showed that 70% of the residents were okay with the tax increase that we did as long as the money goes to what we said it was gonna go for. So um, mm. that's my message. I mean, we're at a place where traffic and transportation is everything. It's everything for, um, everything for people who are living in poverty and trying to get by and have a job and get to their job. Um, it's quality of life, even for people who have plenty of money and don't wanna spend their lives sitting in their cars, it's, it's impacting everybody, and, and we just believe that it's time to come up with a formula to fund a lot more projects all around the state. And I, I, um, I, I shouldn't say I pity you that you have this job, that, <laughs> that you had to sit at MACO with a meeting with every single county in the state of Maryland and tell them that there was no money. There's nothing worse, and uh, you're doing a fantastic job with what you have, all of you. I mean, I'm really impressed with the work that you do. I think this was a fantastic presentation that you're doing what you're doing, um, but my gosh, the, the glass is only a quarter full and we got a lot of work to do, so thank you. Thank you, County Executive, and I would also thank you for uh, lending Ramon to the um, to our commission that's looking at uh, Central Maryland uh, transit. transit plan. And uh, thank you very much for your involvement and commitment we in that, that conference. We love that. We love that effort. Yes, and uh, I, I, the, the challenge, of course, is not only coming up with a plan, but figuring out how we pay for plans, right, as you clearly recognize. So thank you very much for your presentations, and uh, you have reiterated a number of points that you and I have been able to have over the last year since you've assumed your role, and I very much appreciate your spirit of cooperation and partnership on this, and that is the only way we're gonna get things done is by working together, and I suspect in the end it's going to be cobbling together little pieces of resources from one place and another to try to address projects. That's that's the stage we're in, and I think that's going to be that that place for quite some time, unless, unless. Unless we think big. Right. Well, yes, unless uh, we we end up seeing something coming out of the federal government in a you know major uh, highway and transit program. That's that's where I'm at from a you know a hoping standpoint that we could get some additional resources there that would allow us to address more of the issues that we have. And obviously you have, and as you recognize and you have stated. The issue too is on when we talk about transportation and land use, land use drives so much. Of course, we have no ability to impact land use, but we do try to respond to it when it happens. So I'm encouraged that you you are looking at what is it going to take to, to deal with the sorts of development that, that you're dealing with. Do you have um, any comments, 450, any of these other issues? Yes, I, I can address 450 a, a little bit. There's been some confusion on the efforts where we have out there today. So we have uh, some culvert replacement projects that were starting to fail, but that's separate from an additional $1 million that we have invested in the area that has the frequent flooding. So we're looking for, right now we have a $1 million invested where we're really trying to get in the planning and design processes to understand the long-term fix associated with that flooding. Uh, we're looking to be out there uh, next fall. We have a culvert replacement starting it was uh, Huntwood Drive is really kind of the first priority of the four areas as we're starting to get through there so we're in the design process now we're trying to really when it comes to a flooding issue you kind of have to chase the water so you have to chase to see where it goes as you create fix one area it can kind of move the water to a different area we're trying to understand that fully but we're looking to be out there with that additional one million dollars uh, next fall to really start addressing some of those culverts but that system preservation effort that we have on those culverts that were failing there's been some confusion 
question on that. That's separate from the other $1 million that we have invested. So you in can start work next fall yeah. with the million dollars on some additional culverts. Cor see if that works. Correct. So we're, we're, now what we're doing is we're digging into the design process to understand more of a longer term fix to that flooding issue. And then that work will start next fall. So, there will also, so, so there's a design process for a permanent fix. <clears throat> and then the culverts that you're talking about next fall, those are a temporary, right? Uh, I mean, everybody's told me you need to raise the road. Yeah, so I wouldn't call it a, it's more of a longer term solution. Um, but it will make the situation much better. I don't know that it's the the permanent solution. You know, it's a roadway that was kind of built on an old stream bed, and you're trying to manage that and understand how that water is flowing through there as we either raise the roadway or open those drainage issues up where that's going to go. But certainly, uh, the one million dollar investment that's in the design process now that will start next fall is is really more of a longer term fix. I wouldn't put it in the category of a permanent fix, though. So there'll be a plan next fall for a permanent, long-term fix, permanent fix? We'll have a better sense of that. Now, construction next fall. So we'll have a plan much further in advance of that. So I, I think to be clear, right, so that definitely the $1 million is not the current right. work that's ongoing to replace failing culverts. Totally separate. The one million dollars that has been pledged to help is that construction of those will begin next fall. And uh, obviously, one of these issues is if you just go out into an area that's flooding and all you do is open up somewhere for that water to go, the likelihood is if it's not well planned, is all it's going to do is create a flood the next place farther down the stream. So that's why it takes it's it's more difficult than just than just going out and enlarging where where we're seeing flooding today. That's the hydraulic review that's got mm -hmm. to go on so that we don't create a problem somewhere else. But that work that design work is going to go on and then next fall will be the construction of these culverts that we had committed with the one million dollars mm -hmm. that that was a result of our meeting. Does that make sense? L yeah. Let me quickly add one more thing. So, again, there, there are four target locations. One of the one party one that we're talking about is 450 East of Helmut Drive, just beyond that curve. And so, the design effort that they're doing right now is a complete hydraulic analysis for the entire area. And so the work that we're looking at doing next fall is at that site number one. So once we see how the entire system is working, then that's where they'll get into that detailed design for site one. And then they will go on to the additional work for the next site two and site three and so on and so forth. So you won't see necessarily all of the locations being worked on next fall, but it'll be that one priority location. And we made that a priority based on feedback from the community that that location had the greatest impact to the neighborhoods there. And so we figured if we could at least try to fix that, that'll significantly reduce some of the impacts that the residents and commuters are experiencing. How do you want to, do you want to stay on this topic? Because I know the Delegate Bagnall, I know the Senator Riley have some probably a comment here. Or do, you, or do you want to, how do you want to do that? Do you want to bring them up now or do you want to? Sure, yeah. Really? Okay. <laughs> All right. Just with the understanding, we are we have another one of these meetings in Montgomery County tonight, so we have to get from here to there. <laughs> the traffic will be a breeze. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you again. For Thank those you, who don't know, I had a meeting in his office the other day, specifically about the Bay Bridge. Thank you for your receptive attitude. I want to make my comments today concerning the. Uh, Priority letter of October 24, 2019 that Stuart Pittman sent to your office. I, I, I label this the District 33 issue because almost every one of these issues affects District 33, Malone, Saab, Bagnall, um, uh, Fiedler, uh, Hare, etc. cetera. Uh, number one, a Maryland Route 2 Ritchie Highway, uh, very important. The message I give to you on that one is southbound. We have two lanes of traffic at the end of that, merging with Route 50, one in each direction. Wholly inadequate. It's an appropriate study. We want to get people out of that corridor. Number two, Maryland Route 3. I just would like to remind those folks who haven't been here since 2006, like I have, that under the Ehrlich administration, there was a study completed. The title of it was the Boulevard Concept. 
It was re drafted, reviewed, and approved. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Get it off the shelf, dust it off, update it a little bit. It was a very expensive study, and it had a lot of great recommendations. Item number four, Maryland Route 450, Defense Highway. I have to share with you, Mr. Secretary, I'm a little disappointed because when the District 33 caucus came to your office, there was significant information about hydraulic studies, about a list of recommendations and steps that should be taken. I think a lot of the heavy lifting's been done. I just encourage all of you, no matter what your position is, to have a sense of urgency. I understand most of you are engineers, and most of you are very methodical in what you do. I have to share with you, we the citizens of Maryland are in a hurry to get the problems fixed. Please develop a sense of urgency. Uh, the next one, number five, is the Bay Bridge, of course, one of my favorites. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to 450. Uh, Mr. Uh, County Executive Pittman said uh, 60 times the um, road was close to flooding. I want to share with you what was shared with us in the summer meeting. This is, the, this is the second most closed road in the state of Maryland. It's high on the problem list. It also takes 6,000 vehicles a day, including school buses, that when the road is closed, the public access to our public, or the, the public school access and transportation disappears. It's unfair to the communities, it's unfair to the taxpayers, it's unfair to the kids and the parents. Please have a sense of urgency. And on the bridge, again, we've talked a lot about it. Uh, I can just share with you that, um, uh, as I shared with the Secretary, and I want to make sure all of you have a, have a clear understanding, it's my personal conviction that's, that Kent Island has been um, given privileges and benefits uh, because of management attitude. And I ask that just a fair playing field be put before us so that each side of the bridge can have an equal opportunity to extra traffic. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your time. Thank you, Senator, and very much appreciated the opportunity to visit with you and Pat last week. Um, and I, I just wanted to point out one thing on, on uh, Route 2 and 3 is that we are not pursuing a boulevard approach to those roadways. We don't have those kinds of resources. So the activity that is going on right now is to see what practical design approaches we can use to deal with the traffic within that area to either channelize it to do whatever whatever we can with available resources to improve the flow of that traffic but we are we are not pursuing a boulevard approach because we don't have the money for that so Thank you, yes Thank you once again for everyone being here. Um, I'm going to take a, a sandwich approach <laughs> to, uh, to speak with you. So uh, first of all, I do want to say thank you because we do have the Severna Park Shopping Center barriers. They were up. I actually got back from vacation and they were there. Um, I really appreciate that. We did have six accidents in the course of a week, but the barriers are there and, um, and I, I appreciate the, the responsiveness um, to requests that we made at the MAKO conference and I, I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to, to come before the entire, you know, the entire body um, at once. Um, and I do also want to thank you for being responsive to requests that I have made. I'm, I'm pretty much on a first name basis now with Kristen, Corinne, Greg, Jeff, Jim, <laughs> um, Mary. Um, so so I, I, I appreciate that. But there are some major concerns, some of which I brought up at MAKO and some of which I have found out about in the interim. Um, going back to Route 3, um, you and I have talked about uh, the fact that we are ideologically a little different in terms of our approaches to public transportation and um, and public transportation as a as a sound investment but um, but I was made aware that the uh, the park and ride on route three at the um, at the Crofton Country Club that there is uh, a view to to terminating that um, for for a cost savings and um, 
and I, I did reach out to, to Jeff to, to try and find out a little bit more. I, ha I know he was researching it to find out if that was, if that was going forward. Um, and I would actually request that we expand it rather than reducing, reducing that option between Crofton and New Carrollton, actually expand it to Crofton and Odenton to the Mark train as well so that we've got um, more options because the last thing we wanna do is put more cars on Route 3. Um, I'm also concerned about the traffic impact of the Tolson and Associates um, special permits. We had the meeting uh, with MDE, but SHA was not there. So we don't have a clear accounting of what that impact is gonna be. I did take a tour of the Tolson and Associates site. They were very generous in, in providing us information, but they don't have a way of evaluating what that traffic impact is going to be. And I just wanna put this on the radar because because they were saying it may be anywhere from 50 trucks a day to 300 trucks a day. Um, and obviously we don't, we don't have a place for, for, for 300 additional trucks on Route 3. So um, as we are going forward, because my understanding is that that permitting process is well into the process, um, I wanna know if there is a plan to um, mitigate the impact of, of um, the additional commercial traffic. Um, in terms of the 450 flooding, I just had a clarifying question. I do understand that the culvert operation is separate from the $1 million that was, um, that was dedicated to this, but how much of the million is in planning and design? Is, is the million walled off for, um, for implementation or is a portion of that uh, in the design process? It's, it's a very small portion of it, trying to understand the hydraulic models. We had a tremendous amount of hydraulic modeling that was already done. Right. It's just a matter of expanding that so that we can understand the longer term solutions. Okay, that and, and, that, and that is just, as you said, just for that first, that first priority, that million dollars is dedicated towards the first priority, not to the next three, or we're, or we're not sure yet. So, I think I hit another button. So no, so it's not dedicated just to the first site. Um, so just for example, the culvert replacement project that we're working on right now, I believe that was like a $1.3 million project and that was actually four sites. So um, we're looking at, of course, maximizing the money. So that's why we're looking at all the sites initially and then we'll kind of break out in the de detailed design of each of them. Okay, great. Um, and the, um, the sidewalks on 424, um, the, the there, there's a section by the Crofton Elementary School where there's sidewalk, but it's the same level as the road. Is there an intention to have a curb there or any sort of barrier? Um, and again, if you don't have an answer right now, that's yeah. fine. Just put it on the punch list. Yeah, I'll have that in my list <laughs> and, and, and circle back. You on that one. Um, because I, I, I had posed that question, but I just hadn't heard a, gotten a response. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna bring up, I'm sure you're well aware, is the Bay Bridge. Um, and I've got several concerns. I, I, I appreciate, first of all, the, uh, the open communication that we've had. We've definitely gotten a little more ahead of that communication piece. Um, but I know looking, in, looking ahead in the CTP that once we're finished the westbound span, we're gonna be looking at the eastbound span. And I would once again ask that we be really transparent about that. I know that we don't have the punch list yet, we haven't even done the studies, but we need to be preparing our constituents for what's coming. So as much information as we can get out now so we have a clear idea of what this timeline is, because a year from now or two years from now when we finish the westbound span, I don't want my constituents coming back and saying, well, why didn't you tell us this was coming? Um, because we can't say anything till we get it from you. And I know that it's in the CTP, but of course the CTP is 2020 to 2025, and we don't have a clear understanding of what that looks like. So the sooner the better we have that information. I think you know, lessons learned, the more information we have, the more advance notice people have, the more they can prepare for what's coming. But my other concern, and I think the county executive and uh, the senator both voiced the fact that, that we have had suspicions that, that, that the Eastern Shore was, um, was receiving priority, and I think that was confirmed in that press release. You know, Queen Anne's County Commission signed off on the Thanksgiving um, continuation of, of the work. There were several times when I said Queen Anne's County Commission, and I understand part of that is because they are 
you know, they're organized. They've been working on this for a long time. A lot of us are new. Um, but not only is the Broadneck Peninsula not a priority, my bigger concern is that commuters are not a priority because my peninsula isn't concerned about the revenue of, the, of Ocean City. They're not concerned that beach traffic is being delayed. They're concerned about the fact they can't get to and from work and to and from home, and that all of the adjustments that we're making are all about that beach traffic. You know, we're doing cashless tolls on Thursdays and Fridays from 12 to 8. That doesn't help my commuters. And it, it's a pretty resonant message that says you're not a priority. So I would ask that when we're looking at solutions, that we're looking at those commuters, those folks that are living and breathing this every day and that we can do anything in our power to mitigate the impact on them getting to and from their homes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll just try to respond to the to, to the major points that I had heard. Um, one, I, I'm not sure that ideologically we're that opposed to, uh, to transit, but uh, I, I can say from a delivery standpoint and cost standpoint, uh, I, it's my responsibility to attempt to deliver a balanced transportation system that incorporates both transit and highways. And as a state, we have made tremendous investments in transit and we, we have not made that same level of investment in the highway piece. And so for me, I'm just trying to create that balance. And I think we have, to, to a great extent, we have basically gotten to the point where we can't afford more transit unless something else occurs. So I that's- It's unfortunate too, the Maryland Matters article dropped the same. Day is the CTP. I'm not. I haven't read the Maryland Matters one, but I, I've been talking all CTP long, tour long, uh, uh, using the, the figures about you know 42 percent of our state trust fund is going to transit, when eight and a half percent of commuters are transit, are, are trips taken by transit, and three percent of our revenue comes from transit, and so we've got. You know, we, we've got a very heavily transit-oriented uh, expenditure of our resources and, and our highway system, which I will point out that tunnels and bridges and all these things all are a part of, and even buses have to operate on roads. So it's, you know, we have to have that balance. And right now, I'm, I'm the messenger that says we can't afford more transit. At you know, at the way things are, are organized now. We have an Anne Arundel County hasn't run, really been part of that overall transit. Um, mm -hmm. um, and so I think I think that's why we're trying to make sure that we're part of that long term vision. And I think we are with um, with the county's participation in the, the mid Maryland transportation planning commission. So uh, that's, that's all part of it. Um, and, and so uh, and that's, so I won't say, I, I mean, I wouldn't want to, to just simply be painted as being anti-transit. I love transit. I think it has a purpose. I'm just saying we've, we've reached the point where I don't think we can afford more transit, okay? Um, as far as the, the Bay Bridge, I mean, of course, there's been so much conversation about that. Uh, and I, I don't, I, I, I won't agree that there's been more, you know, more emphasis paid to Queen Anne's than Anne Arundel. It's depending upon the topic and depending upon resources and everything else, wherever I am around the state, sort of inferred by the county executive, wherever I am, it's always everybody else has gotten something except us, right? And so I hear that almost anywhere I go, is that it seems like everyone else has gotten their share, but we haven't. And so I just want you to know, I mean, we, we pay as much attention as we possibly can to everyone involved. And I know, I, I know there's concerns about access on this side of the bay, and we hear the same thing on the other side is that it's hard to get across, you know, 50, and we can't, 
you know, we're, we're stuck in our homes because of the amount of traffic. Um, so I hear that. I don't discount it. I don't, I, I don't discount that that's not real and that's not happening. Uh, so much of that in, but in, is being driven by land use. So I can tell this story just because it's not your county, but I can tell you that a resident of Kent Island had told me that he, he, was, he felt trapped in his home and given the work on the Bay Bridge, wasn't sure how they were supposed to get around or how the builder of 2,000 more units of residential property on Kent Island was supposed to get their materials. And so I'm going, there's a little bit of irony there <laughs> that, that there are so many people that feel locked in and yet there, the county has authorized another 2,000 units of residential there. Can I make a request that um, I know you're going to have to run, I know I have to run at five. We have a lot of people who want to speak, residents, and as well as some electeds. Can we? Sure. And I know one of them is about to get up, uh, Senator Bidel. <laughs> Hi, Senator. Guess I didn't what she's going to talk about? I didn't see you over there. Guess what? Thank you. Thank you very much. All of you for being here and for your service to our constituents. You all do a great job. And I told Chrissy, after I went and got my new license, it took less than an hour and I didn't have an appointment. And I was very impressed. So you're doing a great job with that, Chrissy. And we always blame the federal government. Whenever people complain about it, we say this was a federal <laughs> government decision. So, but thank you all. Um, Secretary Brown, particularly thank you to, to your work. But when you first came here like five years ago, I don't know if you remember, you and I had a, our very first sit-down conversation about the parking at the Mark train station in Odenton. Mm -hmm. And I continue to get complaints, and apparently there's been some, Kevin's shaking his head, there's been some remarking of where people can park and can't park, and so it's even limited more spaces. And so we're really hearing a lot about it. So are there any plans to improve the parking at that Odenton station, because people want to use the Mark train, they want to use transit, but they can't park there. Yes, a and that is a problem there. We had five million dollars that was to go into a parking structure there that was to be matched by a development, and I think even the county had committed some money to that as well. And we gave, uh, we were given a number of dates at which that was supposed to happen. We finally said we can't l just have this money sitting here with, with not being used, and we provided a deadline that said, we need, you need to make a decision, you need to commit your share or we're gonna move on. There was, the, the share was never committed, the development did not occur, and we took the money and put it to use in other places. So, and as you've heard, the resources we have available to us are, you know, are, we're at the lean side of, of the, the uh, situation we've been in. Um, we have purchased the 1.9, one, it's one, parcel 159 for 1.6 million. Right, but how much what, what, is it? Was it an acre and a half or what was it? I can't remember. I was thinking 1.9 acres or some, whatever that amount of property is there in the corner, we've purchased that and we're looking at how, how we could use that. One of the things we're looking at is to see if a P3 parking vault might work there. So we're continuing to, to work with that to see uh, what the possibilities are. Because we agree there's a parking problem there, but the, the previous plan was never followed through on by the private sector. Well, I appreciate that explanation. Will you hurry on that other parcel? Yeah. It really has reached um, you know, just a lot of constituent concern. The other issue is 175, and I saw in, in the um, CTP that we have issues now with moving utilities. So you're in the middle of that 175 improvement in front of Jessup Elementary and the 295 interchange. Is this just going to sit there until we move the utilities? How long before we see any movement forward? So, Greg. <laughs> Greg, so, that's just, uh, Greg, you deal with this one. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, just to kind of give a little bit of a history, so when we first advertised that project, we awarded it for construction. It was done under what's called A plus B contracting. So A mm -hmm. plus B contracting calculates time and money, incentivizes contractors that can get in and get out. In the middle of that process, the utility company came in 
uh, to relocate the utilities, used a directional bore underneath the roadway, broke that bore, and then left. Mm. It sat. It sat for a long period of time, so much to the point where we had to cancel the contract because it was creating an issue with the second bidders and competitiveness. So that was what we had to, we had to make sure we were secure on the utility. So we're actively working with them to get that clear so that we can get in and out once they're done. But we don't want to create another contractual issue uh, where we have a contract awarded to a company that just uh, can't deliver because they can't make the utility company get out of the way any faster than we can. So we're uh, continuing to work with our utility companies on that. Uh, I can tell you that I'm working with the utility companies at, at very high levels and trying to make sure we're incentivized. Uh, we now have a really good uh, relationship with the, the local folks there and trying to get that expedited as quickly as possible. We do have this the temporary signal out in front of the elementary school that I think is helping, uh, and then we're committed to continuing to work through that because there's a widening on 175 for that permanent solution once we get out there, but we're going to keep at it. I think it's been, it's I, been I, going I, on, Greg, since I was on the county council, yes. which was 14 years ago, mm -hmm. and we're still widening 175. The other day I was at an event at Mead High School. Fortunately, I was really early because everyone that planned to be there at 730 got there at 10 of 8. Um, you know, it's there's been a, um, a new alignment. It's really a problem in 174, but it just seems like it's been going on forever. Yep. I, and I agree, and I think Greg is being a little too delicate in what he described. I do believe that was BG&E. <laughs> and that was BG&E, and they broke the boring machine and left it for five months. Mm. Not a little while, they left it for five months. I don't did we charge them rent for this? So, yeah, so, and, and I have to tell you, Senator, uh, we deal with this all the time with utilities not getting out of our way, and the public gets outraged, and it costs us money, and we end up paying contractors for delays, and utilities are a huge issue, and, and along 175, there's a lot of utilities. There are. There are. Well, thank you, and I... Hopefully, we'll get an update on the progress. And like you, I have a town hall meeting tonight that I'm going to try to get up 97, which is going <laughs> to, if you've seen 97 at 5 o'clock, you'll know what I'm dealing with. But um, thank you for your You weren't your on 95 to today. We had another trailer jackknife on no. 95 and shut it down. So. No, I was not on 95 today. Thank yes. you again. Thank you, Senator. You said there were other elected officials that wanted to say something? <laughs> Good afternoon. Amanda Fiedler, Councilwoman for District 5. I know I've informally met some of you at different meetings across the county, and I appreciate you coming here today. I don't want to um, be redundant, but I am in District 5. I live just exits from the Bay Bridge. So I need to voice on behalf of my constituents, my neighbors, that we really must focus on the residential impacts of apps like Waze and Google Maps. I have made some contact within Waze, but I really need the help of state agency. Um, College Parkway is the main artery for the Broadneck Peninsula. Off of College Parkway, we have five elementary schools, two middle schools, one high school, and two large athletic fields that our various organizations use for sports. Of all of those schools, all but one can only be accessed through College Parkway. Arnold Elementary can also be accessed through Route 2. When you have children who need to get to sporting events and they can no longer make it on time, that's a problem. Um, we have also seen some commercial trucks on these roads. Um, specifically St. Margaret's Road, which is another artery that kind of bypasses Route 50 when traffic is backed up on the Bay Bridge. We have seen commercial, um, those tractor trailers that carry the cars to the different uh, car sales places located on Route 50, trying to traverse St. Margaret's Road, which if you've ever been on St. Margaret's Road, that is a nightmare to have a truck like that 
go through that, um, that county road. And, and I know there's some folks here from my district who uh, may want to voice their concerns over St. Margaret's Road as well. Um, St. Margaret's Road and um, Penins, uh, Pleasant Plains Road is currently under study. Met with um, some folks this morning from the county. Uh, but that is an intersection that is not only unsafe for people to cross um, or turn, in regular traffic, but you add that that inability to get out into the community from Pleasant Plains Road during the height of beach season, it, it's a huge safety issue. There are blind corners that we're trying to work with State Highway on. Uh, I know there, there are many, many folks here who will probably speak to that who have been involved much longer than I have in the past year. I do want to mention a few other small areas. Um, about a year ago, I sat in on a meeting at, um, Mag I think it was Magathy Middle, to talk about the wrong way traffic accidents in the study um, regarding those accidents. At that meeting, it was noted that there is a state sign at the exit of Baydale that is being held together by one bolt. It is literally being held together by one bolt. It is tilted towards the traffic lane. It has not been repaired yet. Um, if there is any way to get that repaired so it is upright, that would I, be greatly appreciated. I bet we can fix that. <laughs> That would be wonderful. Um, and then finally, uh, BNA Boulevard, when you exit BNA Boulevard in Arnold, um, it just north of um, just north of Arnold Station, that intersection, we've had some overturned vehicle accidents because people are using the shoulder to ride up Route 2 South. Um, if, if there is any way, I, I have lived here my entire life and I've seen the numerous attempts to address that particular section of Route 2 South, um, but it is still problematic and there are still accidents happening there. Uh, I know I said, I know I said that was the last one, but I do want to, um, sorry. <laughs> Something, when I went to the Bragg meeting, and I know there's folks who have some thoughts on the Bragg group, it was brought to our attention that there is a potential for some kind of electronic lane changing on the Bay Bridge. It takes a ridiculous amount of time to change the traffic flow with the cones. Um, if there is a way to expedite the gate system, it's, it was something that was brought to our attention in that meeting, um, that would greatly help the contra flow when, it, when it's flipped back and forth um, because I think it's for an, 30 minutes to change a lane is quite a bit of time for people to wait. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So I'll address the last one that you just mentioned. Um, we have been working on an RFP for lane changing, similar to what you see in Virginia when they do the contra flow uh, on their highway. It'll have those same type gates on it. We um, anticipated that that would parallel the project that we have working on the Bay Bridge overlay project because originally the overlay project was going to take two years. And we anticipated that gate system to be completed in the second year. So we're still hopeful that that could be done. It's going to the board, I believe, at this next meeting uh, for approval of, of uh, moving forward with the RFP. So we are definitely looking at something like that. Good afternoon, my name is Jessica Hare. I'm the County Councilwoman for District 7 in Anne Arundel County. Thank you all so much for being here. I will be super quick. Uh, I'm just gonna echo the comments on Route 450 and the flooding uh, that is part of District 7 and it's a huge issue for the constituents' safety. Um, I, I mean, if there's a, a fire in someone's house and uh, the road is impassable or someone has a medical emergency and the road is impassable, um, I, I've heard a number of people be incredibly concerned about it and I'm particularly concerned from a safety perspective. Um, the only other issue I really want to touch on from a safety perspective uh, is down Route 214 on the Mayo Peninsula. Um, I, I believe it was number eight maybe on the county executive's priority list. I'm not sure what thought, if any, uh, you all may have given to it or what, if anything, the county can do to make that project more attractive uh, to state funding. Currently, it's w one lane each direction. The road is quite narrow in some places with no shoulders. Um, I personally have sat um, for multiple hours when there's been a fire on the road. For example, the whole road gets blocked off because the fire equipment needs that much space in order to fight the fire. 
that in and of itself, I mean, it's working. They're able to do the fire. My concern is then you have a heart attack or something else farther down on the peninsula, and we're stuck. We can't get anybody through. Um, I know that I have worked with um, people from the county executive's office as well as members of the community to try and come up with sort of a desired plan. Personally, shoulders. Can we get a shoulder that's wide enough so that in the event of a car accident or a fire or something like that, we have a passable uh, emergency vehicle place? <laughs> um, and, and sort of, does the county need to put forth some money? Um, will that make it more attractive? Does the county need to come up with some design? What is it that we can do um, so that you all will fund some of that? Can I just add Thank you. on that one, because this is really important, and I, I meant to mention it as well, that the county has done its own study, even though it's your road. We've funded the study, and we've got a lot of public input on that, and and um, so we're ready to talk about fun, about actually implementing some of that, whether it's a, okay. a third lane, definitely we need um, we need the um, the shoulders, but we have uh, two beaches at the end of that, and there's there, there are a lot of people going down there on the weekends as well, um, as well as a development moratorium that was lifted because they recently connected the sewer there. So there are a lot of lots that have been waiting to develop, and they're likely to develop, and it's getting bad. So thank you. Okay. There are, there are several schools on that road, too, so there are also children walking and really no, no safe place for them to do that. Thanks. Okay. And uh, I have been told that... Um, that Odenton, the property we purchased was 1.28 acres, so about one and a quarter acres there. Okay. Hi, my name is Lisa Rodman, and I represent District 6, which is the city of Annapolis and the areas between the Severn River and the South River in Anne Arundel County. Um, a lot of my concerns parallel what my colleagues on the council have already mentioned. Part of 450 is also in my district, so I hear some of that um, concern about flooding as well. So obviously, I'll just reiterate that. Um, believe it or not, uh, backups from the Chesapeake Bay Bridge during the summer actually come all the way down to um, exit 20. Uh, I guess exit 24, Rao Boulevard, that Rao Boulevard and some of the neighborhoods in the city of Annapolis are backed up. Um, and I would just encourage, and that was before any of the recent, um, you know, redecking project was going on. So, which obviously enormous thanks for taking that on because as you said, and I 100% agree, safety has to be absolute foremost. So, you know, if hours we may wait in traffic is, is better than waiting at an emergency room or, uh, you know, dealing with some catastrophe. Um, with respect to that, though, I, I, there's a lot of people that commute into the city of Annapolis from the other side of the Bay Bridge, and even though they're not my constituents, I think this would be a really good opportunity to um, give them um, the option of uh, bus rapid transit to get people across the bridge faster. I know that there are some transit routes across the bridge, but if you want to make traffic mover, uh, move faster and pull cars off the cars off the road. Um, I feel like this is, you know, something that we could expand and, you know, and find different ways to incentivize while we sort of have this opportunity where the traffic is especially bad, get people used to it um, and, and really bring that as an option to get people, um, you know, the more cars we can get off the road, the less traffic we all have to deal with. And if people are willing to give it a try, you know, while the traffic is especially bad, we'd love to see more of that. We have uh, 35 commuter buses. Yeah, 600 available seats. Yeah, 600 available seats right now currently on the, across the Bay Bridge. So we have plenty of transit seats available for people that want to use it. But you're absolutely right. The, anyone who gets on on transit would be another car that we don't have on the bridge. And I guess I, I was aware that you have a lot already out there, but I would say, you know, finding ways to encourage people to try it. You know, you get a week free of, <laughs> of if you're willing to try it, or um, look at the stops and see if there's places that, you know, you might be able to get more people on, you know, using transit, because anything we can do to minimize the traffic, um, I, like I said, we're impacted in District 6, but, you know, District 5, I think it takes the biggest hit um, in Anne Arundel County. So anything you can do to market that option for people and make it cheap or free for, for periods of time so people give it a try and realize, oh, you can actually, okay. you know, you can get there this way as well. And, and I, I'd, I'd like to make one comment. Maybe you can help us on this. Absolutely. Um, when you talk about cheap and free transit, you know, 
so I do the Bay Bridge, right? <laughs> and um, I hear from a lot of constituents that one of the biggest complaints is that they can't take their child and pick their child up from school. And so my comment was, um, you have one of the best transit systems in the world. It picks you up nearly at your house and drops you off right in front of the door of the school and people aren't taking it. And every person that takes their child to school and goes and picks them up has free transit, they're not utilizing it, and they're also driving during peak driving periods. So if you all in the county could help us and get those kids on those transit buses, that would be extremely helpful. I know that currently the school board has a transportation audit to look at a lot of the transportation issues in Anne Arundel County because we have had um, problems in the school transportation. Obviously, that's out of the purview of the council, but believe me, I encourage that 100%. Um, you know, there's a lot that we can do to encourage school transportation, so I absolutely take that to heart, and I'm, I'm fighting that fight. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I thought that was someone who was going to speak. Good. No? All right, any other elected officials? All right, so John or Pat, did, is there, were you here to speak? I'll give it a minute. And we, we've got 12 minutes to be here, okay. so. I'm very brief. Mr. Secretary, we talked earlier. Yeah. Greg, I live on one of those roads that goes directly from here to the Bay Bridge. There happens to be a 45 degree turn in it, and then two roads after that. Where, uh, there are 500 people living down the hill, another 100 at the top, then there's a little school that dumps another bunch of kids out in the street. You can't get in and out of the side roads. You couldn't get in and out of the side roads before we started the Bay Bridge. It's the shortcut to the bridge. Everybody in town knows on Friday afternoon, you don't go out there, you go out the back way. You can't get out. Now, we have had a study, and they took a reading of what happens on Tuesday. What happens on Tuesday, you can get up to 50, 60 miles an hour coming around that corner. You've only got 250 feet, and then you're hitting somebody coming out of the community. Haven't had many bad accidents. It's usually trashy accidents. Little, little things are thrown around the street on Monday morning. Uh, since we've had the bridge, the backup is 20 people coming from Red Hot and Blue, which is Route 50 direction, another 10 people coming from the neighborhood. The neighborhood side sits there for an hour, the red, hot, and blue side sits there for an hour and a half. And then what people are doing is making a U-turn and going back out on 50 and going down to the next exit and coming back the other way. This is just out of control. Mr. Pittman is well familiar with the neighborhood out there. I'd like you to be familiar with it. We met this today with the county. We asked the state to appear. They sent a public relations representative, nobody that could talk to us. Uh, does not make sense. We need more than that. Okay. Please. Okay. Good afternoon. My name's uh, Dick Ladd. I'm a former councilman. Uh, I live uniquely, uh, just moved from two miles on the west side of the bay to two miles east of the bay for a bunch of reasons. But I wanted to point out that this is an extremely complex problem. You don't, I, I'm not saying you don't understand that, but for example, the discussion about Route 2 traffic, that backs up all over the Severn River Bridge, that puts two lanes, get tied up, and that's what slows the traffic down, it drives it, loads up the network up and down the line. 
The one thing that I spent some time, and thank you very much for uh, engaging with me this evening. What we do in the near term to get the full utilization of our bridge structure is incredibly important. And uh, I listened to this discussion, and having been a former councilman, I try to be objective about it. Some people say, you never understood that, lad, but you keep trying, you'll get it. If we don't figure out how to use the reverse lane on that bridge, effectively for both sides, we've got a serious problem. Uh, there's a lot written in, uh, in various places in California, and I, I hope that the, the executive director who talked with me the other night will look aggressively at how we can keep that bridge moving at 1,500 cars an hour, if not get it up to 2,000. That's the equivalent of getting an extra lane on that bridge. And I understand you, you've got some plans on how to change the toll collection, but we need to look very carefully at how we fully optimize the use of those of those lanes over the bridge. And part of that, I argue to you, is getting the traffic off of 50 on either direction. That means fixing Route 2 when the, on eastbound. It means getting traffic up 197 in the morning. This is, this is a systemic problem, and I apologize for saying like I'm lecturing you, but it is a very, very complex problem that overfills all our community streets. And, and we can be patient to a while, and you've heard some of it here, but we need to have some very serious discussions about this thing. And I think central to it is using that reversible lane and finding ways to reverse that thing in five minutes or less. There are ample examples of it nationally of how we deal with those things. I'm still doing some reading, so there's a lot there. We need a lot of very good cooperation from all your folks. I'm not saying they haven't done it, but we're having to do an awful lot of kicking and screening to get what we consider to be the issues on the table, sir. Thank you. Thank you, and there have been a number of references here this afternoon that I, I think that one of the things we are having to deal with uh, on our entire system, uh, and that is the, the effects of Waze and the Waze, way, W-A-Z-E, and the, the fact that people are using that app on their smartphones yes. to get around wherever it shows congestion. And it is taking people into neighborhoods. Correct. And it is taking them in onto streets in front of parks and schools and Correct. every, you know, all the places that traffic was never intended to go. Ways is directing them into your neighborhoods. Correct. It's occurring here. It's uh, across the state. Yeah. We're dealing yeah. with that issue. And, and to which, sir, I, when I when I poke at that thing, I think about the access you see onto uh, Interstate Five in California, where they have uh, control lights where you can control the access onto the road. Yep. From, uh, okay. uh, would you hold on one second? That, I, I'm sorry. Here, I was just going. The, the county executive is leaving, so thank you, county executive. Thank you so much. But, and but, I apologize. But, the, but there's a lot to be said by looking at the metering mechanisms that are on place at places where they can get on. And when the word gets out on Friday, those red lights don't don't blink, unless, unless something. Else. I agree. I used to live there, and I'm not. I don't want to have my access shut off. But there are a lot of things that can be done about access control at the two exits right closest to the bridge. They'll get the message real quick. Pat's done a good job at the problem at the state park. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole bunch of things that we can learn. And uh, thank you for your time. Sir, so you. real quick, let me just uh, address uh, one thing we're looking at very comprehensively uh, together, 97, 50, 23, 450, and 197 as a system and how we can maximize the existing footprint that's out there using technology and controlling the traffic movements. We, look, we think we're going to have some solutions to present to the county in around December time frame, uh, very, very low cost practical solutions that we think can do just that. The problem is just not on the west side. We got, we got to look all the way over the 5301 split. We got two bridges that are complicated bridges that are the problem. And, and actually, the problem all, goes all the way over to the county line with Prince George's County. If we turn around and put, put a bus lane, bus rapid transit lanes over there, and, and what you'll find in the middle of that mess. I don't know what we're going to do with the 5097, I-595 I Central Car uh, Interchange right there. How you get it into the uh, parole parking lot, which will turn out to be your regional mass transit point. That is a big pile of ants we've got to kick real quick. Okay, thank Part you. Part of the colloquialism, sir. Yeah. Thank you.
Uh, Pat Lynch from the Broadnet Council. Uh, we discussed last week many of the issues we were talking about. The one thing I did want to want to bring clarity to is the issue of priority that uh, Senator Ed brought up, and you've heard uh, a couple of times this afternoon. There has been priority awarded to Kent Island, and we did discuss this briefly last week. And the issue is uh, they have they have been and, and uh, at the last. Uh, uh, meeting that we had on the Bay Crossing at uh, Kent Island, I did verify this with MDTA. And they said, yes, we have awarded priorities to Kent Island. Uh, what we think is fair and logical is that Friday and Saturdays is when we are buried uh, with eastbound traffic. And we, we on the Broadneck side, it's not just beach traffic. We have Sandy Point State Park, and we have the toll booths. I'm sorry, Jim. Oh, here you come. Oh, come on, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> okay, so it's not just Bay Bridge traffic. We have got a mess over there. Uh, as Dick pointed out, we did work with the uh, Anne Arundel County Police, and we now have police officers there Friday and Saturday keeping traffic going. We received no help from DNR, no help on, on arranging what was the final solution from MDTA, who owns part of the o Oceanic uh, Road over the overpass. Uh, uh, and no hope from state police. And I'm hoping that uh, the Anne Arundel County Police are compensated because they're taking $40,000 out of their overtime budget just to help us on the Broadneck because no one would come to our help. Uh, priority, why? Uh, we talked about it. There's no hospital on Ken Island. They knew that when they moved there. Um, priority has been given to them now on Fridays and Saturdays when most of the traffic is, it's, it's really haphazard because some people are coming back from the beach uh, westbound, but with us, we have them back to 97, and it's predicted by your LCCA study to go back towards the Beltway within a few years. Uh, we have talked to many of you about the issue. It's It's got to be resolved because we're sitting in traffic watching cars trickling westbound because once those cones are laid out and we've talked about this. It takes so long to lay them out and then pick them up. They just leave them there and say, well, we're just, you know, there'll be another surge of traffic, so we're going to leave them there. And we're asking that uh, Friday and Saturday should be priority for the eastbound traffic, and Sunday and Monday should be priority for westbound traffic. That's logical. That's fair. Thank you. Thank you. We have. Time for one more. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Secretary. I am just bringing some thoughts uh, from Councilman Prusky, represents District 4 here in Anne Arundel County, uh, sharing his concerns about the Fort Meade NSA area and the need for improvements, uh, both highway and also uh, mass transit related. It's a huge economic driver for not just Anne Arundel County, but for the entire state. And there has been little improvements made uh, to the surrounding state roads that feed into uh, NSA and Fort Meade. And he wants to stress the importance of looking at additional bus service. Uh, the largest contingent of uh, employees of Fort Meade and NSA live in Pasadena, but there is very limited bus transportation between Pasadena to Fort Meade. So he wants to stress uh, the importance of that and uh, the economic benefits that would bring to not just Anne Arundel County, but to uh, Maryland as a whole. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And we have now reached 5 o'clock, so we've had a whole two hours. And I want to thank everyone for having come out for this. Uh, we've, we've listened, I promise. We've heard what you've said, and we will do what we can. So thank you. Be careful going home.